Today, I'm getting insights for breaking free from food addiction. I believe life is an amazing gift and I want to make the most of it by becoming my fullest potential and also really savoring the journey. But I do something that gets in the way of both of those things and that's not take good care of myself so I can really feel at my best and fire on all cylinders while I'm doing that. So today I'm talking to Dr. Alan Goldhammer who's an expert in reversing disease with clean eating and then also sometimes water only fasting. He's the author of a book called The Pleasure Trap that's all about the hidden forces that undermine our ability to take care of ourselves because of the addictive quality of modern foods. So today, we're going to be learning how to break free from food addiction once and for all. Welcome to Happiness Adventure. I'm Lisa, and together, we'll explore ways to cultivate real joy in our lives. You're a chiropractor, and when I think of chiropractors, I usually think of people getting an adjustment to their neck after a car accident or something. So how did you get into the very unique work you do around nutrition and fasting? Well, you know, 35 years ago, when I was coming out of school, there was a limited uh, ability to practice nutritional medicine. As a medical doctor, doing fasting would have been considered outrageous. Uh, and a gross violation of the standard of medical practice, that wouldn't have really been tolerated. Yeah. As a chiropractor, chiropractors were much more innovative when it came to nutrition. Uh, we were taught nutrition and fasting as a fundamental part of our education at Western States University in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And later I went to osteopathic college uh, in Australia where uh, fasting was an integral part of the training that I did. I did a residency with Alec Burton, who at the time was one of the people that had the most experience using fasting. And so uh, it was very natural to come uh, through as a chiropractor with an interest in diet and fasting. But today, things have started to shift. We've gone from being criminal quacks to cutting edge researchers because fasting and nutrition have become uh, much more popular. Uh, you have the whole areas of functional medicine and integrative medicine where physicians have recognized the limitations of allopathic medicine that is giving drugs to suppress the symptoms of. Uh, disease and now have begun to embrace the health promoting practices that the chiropractors and naturopaths and others have been advocating for uh, for literally you know 100 years or more. Well in 40 plus years of doing what you've done what is one of the most amazing transformations that you've seen someone experience? Well I see amazing transformations every day you know we and we are in the business of trying to publish the results of those transformations. For example, we did a study where we took 174 consecutive patients with high blood pressure, and we were able to normalize the blood pressure in 174 patients. So, you know, one after another, in fact, it's uh, really quite remarkable how good the body does at healing itself if you get out of the way and let it do its thing. And that's what we do at True North Health is we get out of the way and let the body heal itself. That is such an amazing point that you're not actually needing to do much other than get out of the way and let our bodies do what they're designed to do. I think that's so encouraging. You say in your book, The Pleasure Trap, among other places, that we're not broken in the sense that it's hard for us to resist the food that makes us sick, but it's how we're designed. Could you talk a little bit about what you mean? Well, we evolved in an environment of scarcity where it was difficult to get enough to eat and avoid being eaten. In fact, the majority of humans that were ever born on the planet never reproduced. They never passed on their DNA. They're what we call the losers. Uh, the winners were your relatives. They got enough to eat, they didn't get eaten, and they, they lived to reproduce. But they did this in an environment of scarcity. And so our bodies and our minds were designed for an environment of scarcity, where you know the, that ability to detect, for example, uh, calories accurately and that we valued high caloric density foods was really, really important because if, if you only like to eat salad, you would only get 100 calories a pound, you'd need 20 pounds a day, and frankly, you wouldn't make it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we crave more concentrated foods because that was necessary for our survival. Those that didn't, didn't pass on their DNA. And so we're designed perfectly for an environment of scarcity, which we don't live in. Mm -hmm. And we live in an environment of abundance that we've created because of our innovative skills as humans. We've changed the planet and we learned to process foods and we developed agriculture. We made all these changes. And so now we live in an environment where it's very difficult to avoid dietary excess. Most people are dying not from deficiency diseases, but diseases of dietary excess. 
Mm -hmm. uh, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease are all aggravated by eating too much. And so these are conditions that used to be rare that are now ubiquitous because of the changes we've made in the environment. Our body's design is not going to change as rapidly as we change the environment. Those biological changes take, uh, you know, hundreds of generations or thousands of generations. And we've made these uh, dramatic changes to the environment in just the last few thousand years. And as a consequence, we have a little bit of a dilemma. And that's why we say the hidden force that undermines health and happiness, the reason why people are fat, sick, and miserable, is because they artificially stimulate dopamine production in their brains by using highly processed foods, and more importantly, foods with chemicals added to them. And those chemicals that make people fat, sick, and miserable today are salt, oil, and sugar. So, so SOS, that's what we talk about, an SOS-free diet. It's the SOS is the international symbol of danger, but it also stands for salt, oil, and sugar. Chemicals added to food that stimulate dopamine production in the brain, making us think it tastes good. That's what, quote, tasting good is, is more dopamine production. And with this artificial stimulation of dopamine, it leads us to uh, eating consistently more than what we would normally biologically uh, be satiated with. And as a consequence, we get fat. And once we get fat, we develop the diseases of fatness, the diseases of dietary excess. And that's what you see all around you. People that are fat and sick and miserable and dying prematurely because they're having difficulty controlling what they put in their mouth. Just like cocaine and alcohol and other things can stimulate dopamine production in the brain, so can these artificially concentrated, calorically dense foods, these highly processed foods. So foods are fruits and vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Highly processed foods are when you take those foods, refine them, concentrate them, and process them down artificially. And, you know, it's actually pretty simple. As soon as you get rid of the animal foods and the salt, oil, and sugar and the processed foods, people lose weight. If you're a female, you can expect to lose about two pounds a week, and males about three pounds a week. Males lose about 50% faster because they have testosterone, which is a fat-burning hormone. And uh, females have estrogen, which is a fat storage hormone. So if you're a woman, you have to work harder uh, to get the same results. That's just kind of how it is. So let's talk about how to break free from food addiction. You mentioned those harmful chemicals. Can we go through a list of some of the things that you say we should veer away from in order to break the addiction? Yeah, you can say it very quickly. Just avoid meat, fish, fat, like soy, products, oil, salt, and sugar. <laughs> can, you, can we say that one more time a little slower? Meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, salt, oil, and sugar. Okay. So animal foods and the highly processed pleasure trap chemicals of salt, oil, and sugar. And in general, the more whole food you eat and the less refined processed food, the better. For example, if you eat your fill of oranges, you'll eat two or three or four oranges and you'll feel satiated, you'll feel full. But if you juice oranges into juice, you can drink the juice of six oranges and not even be touched because without the fiber and the feedback that you get from whole foods, mm -hmm. it's easy to overeat. So even a healthy food like oranges you can overdo if you process them in the form of juices and, and this type of thing. For example, wheat has 500 calories a pound. If you boiled wheat berries, well, you wouldn't really like them because they're disgusting. But if you grind them into a flour, dehydrate them, bake them into bread, you get 1,500 calorie a pound food product. Very easy to, be, uh, to gain weight on that, especially if you turn it into a butter boat and spread coagulated cow pus all over it. <laughs> so as a consequence, if we avoid the animal foods and the highly processed foods and the chemicals like salt, oil, and sugar, and stick to whole foods, fruit, salads, steamed vegetables, potatoes, rice, and beans, what happens is you get the quantity and quality of nutrients you need, avoid the dietary excess, you lose the extra weight, you reverse the diseases of dietary excess, and you get healthy. What we do at True North Health Center is we'll use fasting to speed that process up. It turns out that some people that are addicts, that is addicted to this dopamine stimulation from whether it be foods or drugs, sometimes they have trouble quitting. Like people have trouble quitting smoking, they have trouble quitting drinking, and they have trouble uh, getting rid of the salt, oil, and sugar in their diet. And so if they can't do it on their own, we lock them up at the True North Health Center, put them on a medically supervised water-only fast, and within a few days, the palate clears, the cravings go away, the blood sugar stabilizes, the insulin stabilizes, and now all of a sudden, People like the taste of good foods, and they're able to tolerate this radical adaptation back to the diet you were designed to eat.
It makes perfect sense when you liken it to any other addiction that you wouldn't expect to wean off of that without a period of a little bit of discomfort well, and maybe being cloistered away where you can really detox. Well, think about alcoholics. We don't tell alcoholics, well, put your alcohol in a smaller cup and then you won't over drink anymore. Or drink your alcohol with a spoon and put your spoon down between each bite and then you won't be a drunk anymore. We don't tell alcoholics they need to learn to be moderate or just push themselves away from the bar or just drink less. What we tell alcoholics is they need to come up with a strategy to not drink mm -hmm. because they're not able to regulate the quantity of this artificial stimulation that comes from the alcohol. Now, some people can have a beer and not become a drunk, but if you're a drunk, it's not you. And so if you're a drunk, we know the best strategy is to learn to not drink. It's difficult. Some people can just do it. Some people need a little bit of help on an outpatient basis. Some people get benefit from inpatient. Some people can do it with a single try. Some people it takes, you know, many years. But again, if you're overweight, it's probably not you because you've been trying to regulate the quantity. So the better strategy might be to stop it. Stop eating the chemicals that are fooling your brain, whether it's alcohol or cocaine or salt, oil, and sugar. If you just stop it and focus on whole natural foods, over time, it gets somewhat easier until eventually you don't miss it at all. So once you neuroadapt to a healthy diet, the idea of not eating greasy, slimy, fatty, highly processed, dead, decaying flesh is no longer some huge burden to pay. Uh, it's, it's a personal preference and a choice. Your perspective then is an all, an all at once switch is better than a little at a time or moderation. What work, whatever works for the individual. Some people, it's like a Band-Aid. Do you rip it off or do you peel it off slowly? Some people prefer one way. Some people prefer the other way. As long as you get the job done, I don't care how you do it. Or what we do at True North Health Center is kind of an all, or all, all at once, which for some people is much easier. They don't do well trying to tease themselves. It's just like saying, how, what's the best way to quit drinking? Do you first go to beer and wine, and then you cut back, and you, or do you stop it? Well, for some people, the only way is to stop it. And for other people, no, they may be able to wean down and phase out, and you know, that, that's fine. The same thing with smoking. Mm -hmm. but the interesting with smokers, by the second or third day of fasting, most smokers have no more cravings. Wow. Now, some people say they're so miserable with fasting, they're not thinking about the tobacco, but it's not true. What happens is the withdrawal effects are greatly facilitated in fasting. So it's still an intense and sometimes miserable process, but for a short period of time. And people can do miserable for short periods of time, but if it drags on for days or weeks, you know, it overwhelms people. Plus, in a controlled setting like True North Health Center, people have all the support there. So they've got the doctors, the people, the other people they're with, they've got everything's taken care of for them. And so it makes it easier not to have the distractions from their life. And not to mention, you know, the well-meaning but misguided uh, relatives and friends that try to undermine their success. I think I've heard you say, which I really like, that if you're eating whole plant foods, you don't really need to worry about concentrating on exact proportions of what's coming from protein and fat. Well, you're designed to eat whole natural foods. And when you do, the satiety mechanisms in your brain help regulate the quantity. That's why people eating whole food diets can eat until they feel full and they maintain normal weight. You can't say that if you're eating meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy, parts, salt, and sugar. You eat your fill and you'll get huge, like two-thirds of the people in our society are now overweight or obese. If you're not fat, you're actually abnormal because the average or normal person is overweight. They do develop high blood pressure. They are going to get sick and suffer and die and spend 9.6 years on average debilitated as a consequence of their dietary habits. Mm -hmm. So we can you know, talk about health food. Health food has nothing to do with getting healthy. Health foods are like you mentioned, dark chocolate, coffee, olive oil, all the nonsense that people are trying to make, get your money are going to tell you. Healthy foods are whole natural foods, fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And if you derive your diet from whole natural foods, healthy foods rather than health foods, what you'll end up doing is getting a cost-effective source of high-density nutrition without the, excess, uh, the dietary excess that makes people uh, suffer needlessly. Well, you mentioned one I wanted to ask you about, which was coffee. And I had heard that it's caffeine's good for us to prevent Alzheimer's and all different kinds of, there's a big debate, it seems, raging about caffeine. Oh, sure. People love, as Dr. McDougall says, good news about their bad habits. And so the fact is, if you get some study that has an association between increased coffee consumption and reduced whatever X, Y, or disease uh, state, people will be all over that and be excited about it. But you need to remember that th that type of research has some very serious flaws to it because association uh, does not prove causation. And so oftentimes what happens is somebody that's drinking more coffee may be having less, for example, alcohol. And as bad as coffee may be, 
uh, it may be somewhat less bad than the alternatives that it's replacing. So you have to do that research carefully and you also have to look at it critically. For example, they'll tell you that red wine is good for your heart. If you don't drink, you ought to start because it thins the blood. And so the question is, does drinking wine actually thin your blood? And the answer is yes, it does. It works much like aspirin does. And it's true that there's some data suggesting people that drink um, small amounts of red wine have a slightly lower risk of dying from a clotting stroke. However, what they don't tell you is you don't have a reduced risk of dying. You just have a reduced risk of dying from a clotting stroke because you have an increased risk of dying from a hemorrhagic or bleeding stroke. But if it's important that you die from a bleeding stroke rather than a clotting stroke, then perhaps alcohol should be part of your diet. I personally think it's complete unmitigated nonsense that if you compare it to people that don't drink um, and eat a health-promoting diet, you're going to find a much better uh, short and long-term um, outcome. What other things should we do to break free from food addiction and to live healthfully? Well, let's give up on all this nonsense that you're hearing from about the dead Dr. Atkins diet or the keto or paleo diets as if there are some type of sustainable long-term health promoting pattern. Something you do that might be helpful for short-term weight loss isn't necessarily a long-term sustainable point. For example, if you wanted to lose 40 pounds overnight, all you'd have to do is have somebody cut your leg off at the hip. You know, instant weight loss, it wouldn't necessarily be health promoting. But so we can put you on some dead decaying flesh diet and get you into ketosis, which will have a blunting effect on your, on your hunger mechanisms. And over the short run, you might lose some weight. But in the long run, you're going to compromise your health just like anybody on a high protein animal-based diets would. On the other hand, if you realize a lot of the cravings that people get that lead them to overeating is not because of carbohydrates per se. It's because of the use of refined carbohydrates, the use of sugar, the use of flour products, which cause your insulin levels to go up and your blood sugars to go down and then your brain thinks you're starving and so you end up with cravings and bingings and all kinds of problems because your physiology is being um, manipulated by these drugs. On the other hand, people that get their blood sugar levels and insulin levels stabilized by eating a whole plant food SOS-free diet find that they don't have the problems with cravings of whole plant foods it's completely different than when you're feeding people refined carbohydrates, but people are now equating all carbohydrates as the same, whether it's starchy vegetable material, it's white flour products, or it's sugar. That's a mistake. Um, the fact is we're designed to live predominantly on complex whole plant food carbohydrates with small amounts of fat and protein coming from the whole plant food uh, natural constituents. And as I said, the macro breakdown of these diets is around 10 or 12% of calories from protein, 15 to 18% of calories from fat, if you include nuts, seeds, avocado in the diet, and the balance coming from whole plant food carbohydrates. And that diet is consistent with achieving and maintaining optimum weight, achieving and maintaining optimum health, and it can be sustained through your entire lifetime. Uh, and there is no reason to compromise your long-term health for short-term desperate attempts to try to get some fat off. Well, for people who have gone through different cycles of weight loss and gain and loss and gain, who are just desperate to understand how yeah. can I break this addiction once and for all? Then, then what they need to do is read a fabulous book called The Pleasure Trap. And if they don't like reading, they can listen to it because it's available on audio and in, in uh, you know, DVD format. And it explains these mechanisms in excruciating detail. And it also provides strategies for escaping the pleasure trap, not the least of which is our experience with the use of fasting. What role do emotional issues play in our inability or ability to maintain a healthy weight and healthy lifestyle? Yeah, sure. People that have a lot of emotional scar tissue have a harder time making decisions and making choices. People that are not living in a loving and supportive environment where they have antagonism or even abuse have a much more difficult time. But ultimately, it's not your attitude uh, that determines the outcome. It's your action. It's what you do. So the fact is, yes, if you're raised in a loving and supportive environment, you don't have a lot of emotional scar tissue, you live in a supportive environment, you have economic resources, it's going to be a little bit easier for you to make the good choices that result in the good outcome. But no matter how horrific your emotional background is, if you make the good choices, if you can come up with a strategy to do that, you're going to get the same good outcome. So there's nothing about emotional scar tissue that pre prevents the laws of physics and thermodynamics from kicking in. It just makes it more difficult for people to make these very, very difficult decisions. What word would you like to leave with people who are considering making the change to the lifestyle you recommend? Health results from healthful living. You want to get healthy? 
you have to pay the price. And the price is healthful living. And that involves diet, sleep, and exercise. Our approach, we recommend a whole plant food diet that's free of salt, oil, and sugar. Exercise should be consistent. I don't, I'm not as concerned about which specific form of exercise you engage in, as long as it builds strength, flexibility, endurance, and it's something that you can enjoy and do on a consistent basis. And sleep may be perhaps one of your most important activities. And you want to get to sleep so you sleep long enough in a cool, dark, and quiet place that you can wake spontaneously and feel refreshed. Hardly anyone, I think, is in that position. Almost all of us wake up to our alarm clock. So thank you for that exhortation. What is the problem with milk? And people think that it's good for our bones. Um, tell us, set us straight about that. Yeah, well, you know, of course, the, the reason you believe that the milk from cows is positive is because they've had very effective marketing campaigns, including you know, making posters that you put in the classroom of school children telling you that, you know, milk is white, therefore it must be a good source of absorbable calcium and good for your bones. Yeah. The reality is that the calcium in milk has limited absorption as a consequence of the pasteurization that's necessary to keep you from dying from drinking it. The um, fact is that two cups of steamed broccoli have as much calcium as a cup of milk without the fat and the health compromising consequences. Milk is perhaps one of the most anagenic foods that we eat. It contributes to type 1 diabetic, uh, diabetes in children, when, in genetically vulnerable kids. If you expose them to uh, uh, milk products, the immune system can react and destroy the islets of Langerhans and the pancreas, leading to type 1 diabetes. So even uh, conventional sources now advise to be careful about exposing children, particularly under 2, to milk products. Um, milk is, a, and, and particularly in its highly processed form, like, for example, cheese is a massive source of sodium, uh, as well as saturated fat. Uh, there's no fiber. It's all fat and protein. And it's excess fat and protein that are actually responsible for contributing to many diseases, ranging from kidney disease, heart disease, high blood pressure, various forms of cancer. You also have things like bovine leukemia virus, which are spread through milk products, which are not just causing cancer in cows, but maybe also affecting the health of the humans that consume them. Uh, when it comes to otitis media in children, acne in teenagers, and uh, you know, uh, obesity in adults, uh, milk uh, pro and its products can have a contributing factor to all of these conditions. So probably the single biggest and quickest and easiest advice we give people is stop dairy products right out of the gate. And what about olive oil? Because that's another one where we're told that that's a health food, but you're calling it a drug. Well, uh, any oil is a highly fractionated processed food byproduct that's got nine calories per gram. Uh, olive oil may be somewhat less toxic than some other oils, and so they might argue that it's somewhat less bad, but something being less bad doesn't make it good or healthy. It just makes it less bad. I tell people, look, don't, don't eat olive oil, but if you want to just like rub it all over your skin, at least you can then wash it off when you're done and not carry it around all week. 